It's Wait, right. on the uh, James Cameron. Hi. Carry on what you're saying on the subject of valiness. Yeah, you've just given us these. Thanks yeah. very much. So I've got a mouse mat, which actually my son will love. But it's Aliness Saves Lives. And I I just started complaining immediately. Cause, to who? Um, uh, so my operator, who was, uh, um, it was, is turbo bright bloke called um, Gary Joynson. Yeah. Um, he, Royal Tank Regiment, we sent him on the languages course because he, cause he was a bright, you know, he's a bright kid, uh, about to deploy, so what was this, Herrick 13. So uh, pinged him off in order to go and do the long language course, which he went and did at Colchester and came back. And he spoke a different language, all right, but he was just talking shite. I mean, alliness and all of this. Fucking, oh, God. It was a, he was a monstrous pain in the arse. So he just came back and he was banging on about a slightly different color DPM. The, uh, cry precision, this, that, and the other. So, oh, and it apparently made a difference. Different colour? Yeah, oh, I don't know. Dif he, he'd, he'd, he'd saved up, because, of course, by the time you get to Herrick 13, we had some properly decent kit. Yeah. There was new stuff that was coming out all of the time, and you would, even during the course of the tour, you're getting extra things you bolted onto you. I'm going to... Yeah. And, um, and he... Uh, uh, he'd actually gone and managed to find something that he could spend his own money on that hadn't been issued, which was a... Uh, uh, a dump pouch so why you would need a dump pouch as an operator of an armoured vehicle <laughs> we, it was oh when you say operator you mean he drove it no he's the no, radio no. operator yeah so he's the radio op so yeah. he's front left seat guy so we're in Warthog which is a, like a larger version of Viking I think a lot of people saw Warthog you know did a uh, did a spell right at the end of the Afghan war um, and um, yeah he had, he had this dump pouch on his thing but it, it was very important that it wasn't um uh, it wasn't MTP. It was it was cry precision. Apparently that was cool. But every time he sat down, we gently unrolled it behind him and then filled it with rocks. <laughs> and he and he'd have to stand up and move, and of course just find himself tethered down by this land anchor that we that we would do. And it, it was it was just joyous, absolutely joyous. So thank you for my Alina saves lives. I'm going to Gary. One of these is for you, mate, because um, you'll you'll absolutely love that stuff. Cool. But thank Happy you. Days. I'm I'm very grateful. Cry, cry stuff is good to me. Yeah. Because it's expensive and it's, yeah. it's Gucci, it's, isn't it? It's, yeah. 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 And it's like people turn up wearing tap dancers' boots. And he's just like, those are. No, come on. Well, this is the thing with Ali. This is the thing with Ali. Right. Yeah. This is the thing. Pe the, people don't like. Did you see that article I did? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> okay. Now, some, there's a lot of that speculation on the history of it. Yeah. yeah. But the problem is with Ali, people think. Oh, if it if it's cool or if it isn't issued. Now, it's like a mul it's like a the, 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 the meaning layers. now is it's a multitude of things. It's, a, it's yeah, like it, an onion, isn't it? Well, a dump pouch like your man there. Dump yeah, pouch yeah. is cool, right? But <laughs> if there's no if there's no point, what's the you know? It's yeah. like oh, no offense to your operator, mm. but in, 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 all again idea. Why have you got a? <laughs> it looks yeah. apart, but you know it's like uh, it, it was brilliant for filling with like random items. So we used it, you know, sort of rubbish things like that. You'd look round, you know, have some gash in your hand. And rather than wing it, you think, right, where's where's Gary? And just, <laughs> just <laughs> so he'd find all sorts of stuff in the back. It, it was it was it was absolutely joyous, mate. You uh, you reminded me on the phone earlier when we were arranging this, like because I had forgotten all about it. I had forgotten <laughs> two things: caffeine machine down the road, relationship yeah, mission the sport, but more yeah. importantly, the Tony Lewis uh, connection. Yeah. And the West Wales connection. Yeah, I'd completely absolutely. forgotten about. I'm glad you. I'm glad you. Because if you hadn't reminded me, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have come on to it. No, well, he's. Um, yeah, well, Tony. I mean, there's an extraordinary human story behind all of that, um, which uh, which is incredible. And uh, and it's funny, isn't it? You know how you'll have a moment in time which can then change a course of events, which which will just set things in an entirely different way, and you'll end up going down a very different path. And. Uh, I think that tour, Herrick 13, and we sort of spanned a bit into the next one, um, had quite a profound effect on me. And I came back and really wanted to do something in order to help the people that I'd seen affected by by that tour and by military service, a sort of broader piece on that. And, of course, Tony and family were also responding just to, to absolute tragedy. And But he has also... Oh, it was the same tour, wasn't it? Yeah. It was the same tour, yes. Yeah, of course it was. Yeah. Um, then he'd he'd also turned himself to uh, looking at where in his professional capacity could he also make an impact on 
on those lives of people, um, you know, people whose lives have been affected by by that sort of thing through 353 and through other things that he's been able to sort of touch along the way. And um, Westway, you know, and that's 15 dealerships. Um, they're owned by Nissan GB. Um, so it's a, a sort of manufacturer-owned dealer network, but one which, which Tony's the managing director of. And a bit of his enthusiasm and his love finds its way through into every single one of those dealerships. So um, he... Um, uh, his sponsorship of things like this, and and also things like um, the the British Army's parachute display team, all come down to you know those something that happened on on the other side of the world, you know, sort of an awfully long way away. Um, but it brought us together again as well. Again, when, again, did you know him before? Did you? Yeah, we'd sort of um, no, not particularly, um, but we'd sort of met a few times um, uh, following uh, Herrick thirteen. Um, but it was um, uh, the work which the charity which I now run um, uh, was doing, which all about putting guys and girls into careers, helping them to support their families after the military. Um, we launched a, a really big initiative called Mission Automotive, so to take it from uh, the charity's work to being much broader across the whole of, of UK automotive. And that's an enormous industry. I mean, last year was £82.5 billion pound turnover. Let's see what it is next year. Um, but uh, uh, that's an awful lot of people. It's about 850,000 people are employed directly by the automotive industry in the UK uh, in, the different, uh, in different bits of it. And a lot of service leavers and veterans struggle to uh, find their way across into what they can do as a civilian. And and either don't end up where they could be, or end up underemployed because they they've struggled to articulate exactly those qualities that make them desirable, and those transferable skill sets. I mean, there are very few jobs in civilian street, um, uh, sniping, but there are lots of jobs in civilian street for snipers. It's just relatively few of them involve dropping people quite a long way away. Um, but, uh, y you know, you don't know that when you're serving. I think, you know, if we look back to how we, how much we've learnt since, you know, that time of bouncing around Afghanistan, you know, when we were both in service, um, to how much you learn afterwards about how the world goes around, how commerce works, what civilians do for a living, and what makes them tick, um, you look back and you sort of think, gosh, you're really naive. And a lot of things that worried you then, or that you were afraid of, or insecurities which you had about yourself, you suddenly realise that actually those just weren't things at all. And actually stuff that you were really proud of in service is a huge strength afterwards. Um, but you never really recognised at the time that it would be. Um, so when we came to launch Mission Automotive, um, we, uh, I mean, we've run Jaguar Land Rover's Armed Forces Engagement Scheme. You know, we, we helped deliver that big initiative. And that's put over a thousand veterans into employment, a thousand and thirty-eight at the time of, uh, you know. So that, those are those are pretty good figures. And that's since um, uh, beginning of two thousand and fifteen. It's really since the first Invictus Games. Um, so we've learned an awful lot from doing that, and rolling that out across a bigger stretch of industry. And Tony was one of the the first people that we kind of thought of and said, look, we, we need to represent a broad swathe of industry and we don't have anybody who's particularly in retail. And I think there's a really, really compelling story for them to tell as well about their sponsorship of things like this, about their sponsorship of things like the Red Devils, to go, you are having a positive impact on that armed forces community through um, uh, what is a commercial concern. It's not owned by the government. You know, it's not, um, uh, ultimately it has to answer to, to the people who own the company. And uh, uh, and you're managing to link it and you're managing to do something that's really lovely and others should learn from that as well. And Tony, bless him, agreed with us. So, you know, when we launched Mission Automotive back on the 1st of March in 2019, so, I mean, that initiative is about, you know, what is it, sort of 10 months old now, a bit less. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was with... One of his cars that's covered in, you know, Red Devils sponsorship stuff, um, and uh, you know, and that initiative has just grown, um, grown and grown since then. Um, 
And it, it just it, it brings me an awful lot of pleasure when you can kind of shine a light on something like that. And you go, oh, you know, they're selling cars. You know, and it may well be they're selling cars that you don't like. And that kind of colours the way that you perceive things. There's that bit of the, the automotive industry that's, that's trying to flog your cars, you know, whether it's an Arthur Daly kind of, kind of way that people look at it. Yeah, there are people like that in the industry, but there's also people like Tony Lewis. And, uh, yeah, and uh, to be able to shine a light on that and go, this makes a difference and other people should do things like this, I think is something that, that I'm quite proud of being able to have, have done for the last sort of six months or so. Yeah, you're right. It's, um, it, through, it's through Tony and, and like yourself and people like Steve Thornton as well from uh, from Forces Cars has obviously been on. It's... It's opened my eyes to uh, look, look, the, the, the the spectrum of the types of people across military veterans is exact is exactly the same as the types of people you get across like Sith Pop. You get yeah people who aren't asked to people who get to chuck everything in. You get people who aren't that uh, mm. uh, morally uh, mm. morally well guided as other people, and then you get the likes of mm. Ch- Tony Lewis on the other end. You know, yeah, absolutely. And through Tony, the the, the people I'm being exposed to. It's really refreshing because yeah. of the honesty in it. And, and I've also been involved with the 353 Trust, both directly and through friends. And again, it's reflective of, of Tony himself, just mm. uh, the energy and the time he puts into that stuff. Mate, he's the MD of Westminster Sun, you know what I mean? Mm. And he still Busy boy. chucks all of his spare time, most, mm. a lot of his spare time. There's some golf in there, mind. Yeah, there That's, is. <laughs> a yeah. lot of his spare time into how to help veterans. How, 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 how does he go about it? Yeah, you know, yeah. th- from his from his own past, from obviously the tragedy of uh, Conrad, and then from just being a, a part of that wider network. Now it's just, it's amazing. So it's, it makes me really happy I, I, with the sponsorship side of things. Mm. I I we, we I've discussed it with the missus before. It's like I would hate to have a mm. sponsor. I, I I'm not invested mm. in. I don't believe in. You know, and I've got it's got to have I'm, meaning. A hundred percent, mate. Yeah, totally. I got West and I have got you know r- rugby heroes. It yeah, couldn't yeah. get any better. It no. couldn't get any better. But um. Tell me about, tell me about Mission Automotive. And tell, tell me about where that started, maybe, if you don't mind. So, um, well, I mean, in fact, sort of, no, in fact, no, no. For the benefit of the listeners, there you go. Who did you serve with? When did you serve? Uh, so I joined the Royal Tank Regiment um, uh, straight after university. So um, uh, I uh, got posted across to Germany in the late 90s and spent a chunk of time bouncing around on tanks um generally being uh drunk and incompetent i think it probably best sums up my time off duty as a mm. (laughs) (laughs) but uh but you know and that's kind of your job though really yeah particularly as you know young officer um (laughs) i I remember being in charge of senalaga pony club uh, at one point, I think that was one that was a secondary duty. That was a particularly plum one that I was particularly proud of, and I think I'm, I managed to fuck that up. <laughs> quite, quite. But say there were some very disappointed um, young girls and uh, uh, senior officers' wives who then wrote stone letters about about uh, Second Lieutenant Cameron, who was clearly a fuckwit. Um, and uh, I spent I spent a chunk of time doing that, so I kind of learnt the armour piece, and then. Um, I did a Cyprus tour, so I did a bit of a United Nations, a uh, bit of United Nations time, and then um, was back at the Army Foundation College at Harrogate, actually when that place was reopening. Um, so it didn't look like it did now. This was kind of the old site that they managed to, <laughs> that they repainted, but because it was the MOD, they repainted it on the day in September that every daddy long legs in Yorkshire <laughs> came out of the grass and then stuck themselves to this freshly wet paint. <laughs> And then the next day the place opened and the whole place just looked like, you know, it was um, yeah, it was lightly feathered because there's just everything had had Daddy Longlegs' stuck to it. And that, that was fantastic. It was a bit of broadening for me as well. I had a, um, uh, I had a mostly infantry training team and, uh, <coughs> and that was a bit of a joy. And a platoon sergeant who was a bloke who, who I just looked up to so much. I learned a ridiculous amount from him. Um, uh, a guy called Rich Carter, who's um, who was Duke of Wellington's, and funnily enough, had I been in an infantry regiment, that would have been the one that I ended up in. So I'm from Leeds, and and they they were they were our sort of local mob, the one that the school CCF I think was affiliated with, and he was ace, he was absolutely mega, 
And I think actually there was a point where I was going to get out of the army and may well have left at my three year point, but, but there was a bit of education that sort of went on. And so and I came back to the regiment. The regiment was doing weird things at that point um, and was off um, uh, doing this horrible joint NBC regiment job. Thing. This is kind of Cold War stuff going on, like training and anticipation going on that stage. Yeah, no, so a ton of that. So I'd done all sort of batters and Canada and um, uh, and a Poland as well. So the, you know these big these big exercises on armor, and then ended up and had this had this really extraordinary period because I had an environmental sciences degree, so I ended up understanding um, more than you'd probably like to let on. Um, but then that got me doing a series of really interesting stuff, working with really interesting different agencies. Um, bouncing about the place, and uh, and of course you know you then had September the 11th, and so um, uh, by December 2001 I was I was in Kabul, um, uh, doing some some really creative things, and then Iraq three years later. So I spent a chunk of time doing that. What do you mean creative? Can we can we talk? Can we go on that? Or? Yeah, no, we can. Um, so sort of rolling back the clock and thinking about you know when we put British troops into Afghanistan um, in the wake of this Al-Qaeda attack and uh, the whole weapons of mass destruction thing was was a particular concern. Um, we we were running a light roll team, which basically was a thing which, which we made up um, of, of a bunch of guys who were very technically proficient with very good links back to the likes of Port and Down and some of the supporting services in the UK and some interesting things that were in theatre and also um, in some of the surrounding countries and went looking for a number of things which were of concern when you suddenly put Brits back into the middle of Kabul. And, you know, the intelligence services have a list of, you know, these are um, things that we're particularly interested in, concerned about, all the rest of it, uh, some of which might be because there was intent other things because they were bloody dangerous. And so uh, we ended up um, finding and securing a Cobalt 60 source, which was a dirty, great big radioactive source. It was used for medicine, so it was used for radiotherapy. In Kabul? Yeah, right in the middle of Kabul, um, on the old uh, university hospital site, which... Um, was really quite exciting you know so you know doing stuff like that and i obviously managed to do it sufficiently competently in between me and the rest of the team and have my metal mug down my trousers to have kids subsequently so it went okay but when you're calling in the international atomic energy association into you as a young captain you know um uh in in the middle of kabul and you know and you're bringing people in by antonov you know and you popping in and out of Pakistan in an Illishin in order to, you know, sort of get random stuff like a fridge that we need to buy. So, yeah, let's, let's, let's pop out to Pakistan to go and get it and hitch to lift in an Illishin to do it. it. It's some pretty kind of cool stuff. So, actually, I found myself really enjoying that sort of weird second phase. And then um, a long, you know, post-staff college and a bunch of other things, I then came back to regimental duty. Uh, so, I commanded it at... at, at uh, the first Royal Tank Regiment, and then was was incredibly fortunate to be asked to come back and command the second Royal Tank Regiment, who were lining up in order to go and do this armoured tour. Um, and Warthog was this urgent operational requirement that was brought in to replace Viking. And I've got a um, had, had a history in doing um, sort of technical acquisition kind of things. Um, and so I just happened to be the right sort of bloke at the right time, all the rest of it, and was incredibly privileged to take over a, you know, a bunch of guys at the start of their... Uh, we actually did I actually did a full armoured batters. I hadn't been on tanks for an awfully long time. So um, I had to go and do a... I actually had to go and do a conversion course to convert me onto Challenger 2, and they'd stopped running that course four years previously, so that's how, <laughs> that's how out of date on armour I was. Um, and uh, uh, And then bounced out. Along with sixteen brigade on onto onto Herrick thirteen, and yeah, I so that's with bags then. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> what did you say that for? Oh no, well he, he's a joy. He was never actually one of mine. He's um, mate. I love bags. Yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah well, he he's, was based with three he's, paras. Uh, uh, I think with B Company. Yeah, he Which was. was yeah. Where were you then? He was so well, bouncing about all over the shop. So. Um, well, wherever the war talks were, really. So I was, I was bouncing in between 
So I had two main troops, one of which was in Babaji, so it was, you know, chucking around in that area. Average engagement distance is, I don't know, 75 yards, something like that. You know, folk climbing up the bar armour at times, you know, that was all quite exciting. And then out in the desert on the 611 in between, uh, on that road building effort that was Peace Street, as they called it, which was ludicrous. There was building this road up to Sangin. Um and it was directly through what the Taliban had firmly considered to be theirs, as everyone else had kind of vacated it, you know, um, that, that sort of pit of snakes that was... Was this where you had the encounter with the, uh, the, the what would you call it, the uh, uh, Taliban Hells Angel? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah, because they'd use, yeah, well, basically you're fighting a manoeuvre war. Um, and I think uh, one of the big problems around, I mean, you know, Viking, it was tragic, the number of people that we had lost um, and it was because it was being successfully targeted so um, it, it was not brilliantly um, well it was it was pretty rubbish against IEDs um, but then so were boots you know um, so what do you do you try not to set the things off but I think um, the Taliban have been very successful at reducing our will to manoeuvre and Warthog came along, built for theatre, you know, much, um, uh, certainly much better blast attenuation and things like that. It's still a rubbish day if one goes off underneath you. And so all of the same kind, same kind of um, restrictions would really apply, but because we changed the name and because actually um, 16 Brigade, you know, you've got a brigadier who's not afraid of trying interesting and new stuff. You've got a chief of staff who I went through Sanders with. Was it Giles? Was it Giles then? The brigadier? No. Who was that? No, was it not? James Chisholm. Oh, uh, uh, no, I can't remember. Anyway, go on. There you go. And, um, and, a, and a chief of staff who was, who was absolutely brilliant and knew me of old and, uh, and had the trust to be able to go, yep, yeah, all right, you know what you're doing, off you go. Um, uh, off we went and instead of being based in Bastion we just went out and didn't come back in again um, uh, you're working very closely with the infantry in um, in Babaji in the close in the close territory you know of Helmand River Valley uh, but in the desert there's there was only us you know there were no bases there was nowhere to hide behind there was no way we went on a night time you put the wagons in a circle and um, uh, and you moved every night how many wagons were there? Uh, well, the the troop that was out there. So I think in total something like thirty six. So it divided in between two troops and a uh, an attack group, which was sort of my five five war dogs, with an incredibly high quality bunch of people. You've got five of these of these things, and they're amazing. Um, and that's an awful lot of that's an awful lot of war that you can take. So when you turn up, it makes a difference. What and was the what was the weapon systems on them? Um, a mix. So you had. Um, I can't remember. I can't. Well, you had fifty cal, GMG, so the grenade launching thing, um, and good old fashioned GPMG. And actually, GPMG was the weapon of choice. Um, Why is that? Because it you could be an awful lot more subtle. You could use it with much less worry about collateral. When you pulled the trigger, it worked, and that's a huge thing. Because they're very exposed, you know, on the top, just in dust all of the time. You know, you can't, you, um, you can't kind of mothball it. So when when it you wanted it to work, it it had to work, and you could be and you could be really quite precise with it, um, uh, within the range of a beaten zone. But funnily enough, you know, one of Bags's mates, um, uh, one of my young troop leaders, was out in the desert when uh, something was firing at him on the horizon, and um, they could see the flash of this thing firing, so fired back, and could see that the rounds that he was firing were falling short. So you know, GPMG beating distance about eighteen hundred meters. So all right, so let's drive towards. Yeah, eighteen hundred meters if it's in the SF position, but not if it's. On a... Yeah, well, it's a turret mount, so. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah it's yeah, pretty yeah. good. So yeah, it's, sorry, yeah, and yeah. it's a nice elevated. Yeah, it's pretty. It's yeah, a pretty yeah, good yeah, platform. Yeah, yeah. So fired, fired back, but it's falling short. So right, okay. Brrr. So let's motor towards it. So he motored towards this thing that was firing at him. It took him a couple of goes before he got there. And we worked out um, he'd driven three and a half Ks, and the thing that they were firing at him was a towed anti-aircraft gun. <laughs> I can't remember this. <laughs> and 
you're like talking to him about it afterwards and like, you know, were you not questioning you're driving towards the thing which is shooting at you for three and a half kilometers? And he's like, yeah, I really want to, I really wanted to hit it. <laughs> And they, they'd just been very lucky, you know, so they'd had a couple of jerry cans that they found some very large caliber holes in. Um, and then rolled back, looks at lots of clever mechanisms of going who was where when and discovered, yeah, no, this thing. Um, and it's because we were reducing the Taliban's maneuver. So they'd rolled back this road building crew that had its own security force of 800 people. Um, and they'd, uh, and they'd, they'd launched a, a deliberate attack against them. And done some pretty horrid things, you know, lined them up and then shot them all within the view of the next. Cause they oh, were, really? They basically made these little forts dotted down this road building thing so that they could maintain constant eyes on. And they just rolled them back one by one, all the way up to the one. What, just killing one. the people who were building it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we sort of, you know, came along and, um, and lived in the desert for... Um, a quite a long interrupted period I forget how much it was now but there was a bit of a sort of big deal made about it at the time because you've got lads who were who were properly out there was no HESCO for them to hide behind and we were moving location every night and in order to be able to do that you've got how do you logistically supply that so I went back into uh, Lashkagar into the headquarters um, I used to quite enjoy going in there because you've got a lot of blokes who are basically my peers who are staff officers you know, so these shiny bottom desk jockeys who you just love going in and calling darling. You know, you'd, you'd roll in all windswept and interesting, covered in stuff. And we caused a bit of a fuss when we turned up. And you drove into a, um, uh, you drove into a, uh, it's like an airlock um, where you get into. So they open the outside gate, you drive in, they close that in order to then release you and you drive inside. Um, it's pretty obvious if it's a warthog, you know, that you're not a, you're not somebody masquerading or something bad. So it's normally a bit of a formality. You roll straight through. And we drove into the airlock, and um, and there's just no sign of anyone. So the other gate didn't open, and we just sort of sat there going, oh, for, come on, you know, I need to be in. I need to be in this. I need to be in this O group. And uh, uh, so you're like, right, press to transmit, but you've already dropped the antennas because you have to drop the antennas when you're going into it. It's like, that doesn't work. So oh, this is bloody silly. So I get out the top of the wagon, and looking, just trying to find somebody, and looked down at the front and went, oh, we've got a, we had an RPG stuck in the, in the bar armour <laughs> in the front. We had a bit of a dust-up on the way there, but nothing, you know, it's just standard day, isn't it, in Helmand? <laughs> and we, we hadn't noticed. So, uh, but unfortunately, the people in Lashkigar had, so we, we caused a bit of a, yeah, sorry about that, chaps. Sorry, <laughs> first, let the bomb dispose of guys go and, go and deal with it. In the meantime, I sort of wandered in, you know, and sort of, how are things here? Everyone's <laughs> looking at me like I'm nuts. But um, I, yeah, I went and found the guy who was, um, who was sort of SO2 Logistics and said, um, uh, it's, getting, it's, it's difficult to sustain operations out there for fuel as much as anything else. So we talked about, there was a bunch of things that we could deliver in different ways. Packed fuel is an absolute nightmare if you get that delivered. So we were getting resupplied by Hercules that was coming over and, you know, doing the old pallets out the back and dropping stuff to it. It's great with water and rations and things like that, but packed fuel is a nightmare. Um, and, you know, it's a pain in the ass for the boys, all the rest of it. And then you've got a million jerry cans you've got to work out what you want to do with. Um, so uh, I came up with a brilliant idea and said, um, uh, I want the fuel tanker that's at, um, and it, it wasn't at price. They moved it forward to make it a bit more convenient for us. And it was, uh, it was a little bit further along the road in, um, uh, at, a, at a checkpoint. Uh, and I said, well, I basically, I'm, I want that fuel tanker. I'm going to go and take it out. And they said, well, where are you going to take it? And I said, well, you know, into the desert where we are. And they went, well, how's it going to get back again? And they like, well, it'll stay with us. And I'm like, well, how, how does that work? How are you going to do with a fuel tanker? And I go, look, you, you've seen, um, oh, what's the Australian film? You know, Tina Turner. <laughs> no, not Mad Max. Mad Max. I said, you've seen Mad Max, haven't you? And the bloke's looking at me. And he can't work out whether I'm serious or not. And in the end, he just sort of laughs about it. And goes, no, I'm deadly serious. We want to, you know, we'll go and take it out and look after it. And uh, so They're not armoured, though, are they? No, they're not, no. No. <laughs> no, so we sort of put it in the middle. No, it was fine. And we had a bunch of, yeah, household cavalry guys there as well. So we had some scimitar and stuff out with us at the time. And it turned into quite a big and interesting thing because the Taliban had brought out this high-value weapon, anti-aircraft gun that they were firing, you know, at us, or sort of five and a bit K, because we were really pissing them off. So we're like, yeah, this is great. It's really good. So let's 
let's try and tease that out. Um, and it's amazing, you know, when you then have that focus of attention switches onto onto that. I had a troop leader, you know, this lunatic driven driven towards it, Andrew Max, just a great kid. Um, officer or NCO? Yeah, officer. Yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah, he was a yeah, he was a lieutenant. So uh, same vintage as bags, I think. So you know, to give you yeah, one of them. It's a good vintage. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, no, yeah, they are. They they're, they're absolutely fantastic. But. Um, but you know, and then then of course his OC would tip up me with an extra five, with an extra five wagons, and that, uh, uh, and then a whole load of other assets and and a you know forward air controller and a whole host of things you know. So we then have the world all looking in on this bit, um, and uh, and of course there's no sign of the thing. So going well, okay, let's how can we how can we push the buttons in order to get them to bring it out. We spent a very exciting two weeks pressing buttons in order to get the, the Taliban to bring it out. Was it a Z issue? And then snotting it, yeah, yeah. Two, four or two? No, it, no, it was... You've got 23, two and 23, you've got one of the two, two, no. you got two uh, barrels and the four barrels. They have, those are beasts, mate. Yeah, it's a big thing. And the beating, a, the beating zone on that was about, was about a K. <laughs> it is, and, and particularly when they're firing it flat, basically. Yeah, yeah, they, they, were in, uh, they were in Kajaki, and uh, the police used to use it. I mean, used we used to see, don't use the ZSU because they'd open up with this to trying to hit a couple of Taliban, yeah. and but they'd end up, you know, the beating zone was like it wasn't a K, but it's like five hundred meters. Yeah. So these rounds is going anti-aircraft gun trying to hit things on the ground horizontal. It's just disaster, and it's, disaster. And it's, and it's yeah, what's behind there as well because that it doesn't exactly. stop. Yeah. They don't well, stop. Those well, we were on the we were on the hill, yeah. so you could see where it was going. You could see where the rounds <laughs> are going. They couldn't see oh. it because they were level, you know. <laughs> I mean, they'd, yeah, those guys, well, they'd, the, the bad guys had wiped out about one and a quarter million quids worth of road building kit and stuff like that. So, and, and completely mucked up the project. And of course, they laid IED. So as you were going back out again, and, and you're just playing this sort of, this, this cat and mouse game of escalation of, you know, we, we twigged, they were laying, they were laying IEDs directly in our, um, in our tracks because we, we would tend to use, we would tend to use the same tracks, and we'd figured out that they'd figured out that they were doing that, and they were they were laying there. So you'd then you'd avoid those, and you'd then go parallel to them. So they then started laying off. Why would you use the same? Just out of interest, because that's different to the foot tactics. Why would you use the same tracks? It it depends. So it completely depends. So it depends how much observation you've had on it, and how often you're going. Yeah. But to be able to return and go, IEDs could be anywhere. We passed by this way earlier today. We've had pretty good eyes ever since. So where's the safest place to go? Yeah. And you've got to take a gamble. Do you go, I'm going back up what I know is approved route and hoping that no sly bug has been in there in order to lay something in your absence? Or do you go, I'm going to roll the dice again and roll across a fresh piece of desert? Um, and that's that's quite interesting. We, But they they were doing some really interesting targeting of us too. So they, they had some quite sophisticated stuff that was double... Um, pressure plate, because obviously ECM can protect you an awful lot from from stuff which has come from from the side. It's difficult to run a wire for any length of dis distance in the open desert, unlike in. So you have two troops that are learning completely different lessons. One really close contact, and the other open desert. They're getting shot at from uh, five and a half k's away. Um, so, so was the desert? Was the one in the dash? Was that shadowing the one in the close the close quarters? Yeah, and they well. Um, uh, and you're seeing very different tactics and all the rest of it because they're two very different bunches of talent that you're fighting. But they're in mutual support of each other, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, no, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, then, yeah. and then me and Tag Group bouncing in between the two. And you're sort of going from sublime to the ridiculous or, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, yeah, I'm just trying to find the, um, oh, yeah, ZPU. So 14.5 millimetres. Oh, ZPU. Okay, right. Yeah, so towed wheels on the side of it. Yeah, got you. Yeah, big chunky thing. Um Anyway, we got it. It was right. It was so, you know, sort of strange looking back on it. And people go, "Well, gosh, you know, you ever get that when you're a civvy?" And they go, "Well, you know, at least no one's shooting at you." you know, that was the fun bit. And they forget completely. You spend all your time training, and someone's shooting at you, and that's when actually life becomes really, really clear, simple, straightforward. Yeah. yeah. And you know exactly what you're doing, exactly where you're placing things is, and it's a, it's a rush, it's a buzz, and you're surrounded by the finest of people who you know would do exactly the same thing that you would do for them 
and that's that's an incredible feeling and you don't really get that you know sat in traffic on the m40 um no that simplicity is a is a huge one it took me a while to realize that that's what that's one of the things i was not, not missing but one of the one of the things that um has such a big impact on people when they leave because it's been taken away but they don't realize mm. it's not what it's not what they've been introduced to it's what they haven't got anymore <clears throat> that simplicity of being on tour mm. yeah you know oh we, what, we, i wish i was back in afghanistan i wish i was back in iraq and you think, well, why? Oh, well, Sounds it, ridiculous. And you, yeah. and you see, and people assume, oh, they're, they're buzz, the adrenaline, you're going to do the, do the shit, get in, get mm. Well, that's, that, that may be it, maybe slightly part of it. The mm. bigger part is, like you say, very, very simple. Yep. You know exactly where you, you know exactly where you stand in life. You know exactly what you need to do. Yep. It's everything is, everything is clear cut, clear cut. The heart, in the, uh, like since I left, when I, one of the hard, I'm going to off track here, but it's an interesting point you brought up. And this is a recent sort of revelation to me. The times I I find um, so just normal work. Mm -hmm. Times I find it a bit, a bit. What 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 the fuck am I doing? Mm -hmm. Is when there's ambiguity in what I'm doing. It's, yes. it's like okay, I've been given I've been given a task, for example, but it's a bit ambiguous what that task is, and yeah. maybe I'm working with other people. I'm not. It's not clear who I'm working to. It's not clear who's working for me. Yeah. It's just all a bit. The time, which is a shit. The time's on fire is when it's like, yeah, yeah. QKIA, task. Off you this, is, yeah, use the parameters, go, bang. And I'm like, mm. fucking right, get in there. I'm, I'm, and it changes my, I'll, mm. next morning I'm up, I'm fucking up at 6 a.m., I'm good to go, and I'll, you know, just loving it. And that's just a hard back to what you said, the simplicity. I've yeah. know where everything is, clear cut, I've got a task, I'm going to achieve it, I know what my objective is, I know what the end state is, I'm going to fucking murder this. No, well, they, I mean, people, um, pay a fortune in order to go and learn about mindfulness. Yeah, I'll tell you about mindfulness and being in the moment. <laughs> well, there isn't, there isn't room for worrying about your gas bill. Um, you are very much you and everybody around you. It's really interesting because, um, yeah, man. I mean, rugby for heroes, sport, anything like that. Because when you're on the field and somebody passes you the ball, you're not fucking thinking about anything else. No. Well, not for long, because <laughs> someone's going to catch up with you. Um, and and that's one of the reasons why sport can be so fantastic. It can be so restorative and healing. Um, and we run a 12-hour endurance race across Remembrance Weekend that the first time we we looked at doing that, I mean, that wasn't my idea. We, uh, I mean, I think I'd created the conditions for Anglesey Circuit to want to give us a weekend, but it was a guy called John Earp. Um, helicopter pilot IRP yeah yeah um, who now flies um, air ambulance Carnarvon so North Wales so he spends all of his time you know dodging Snowden um, uh, in clouds and side wings and things like that and John John said look this is a fantastic opportunity we should run a race there I mean, that's a ridiculous idea I mean yeah track day yes you know perhaps let's do a bit of instruction for people but in November, that's beyond the end of the season. Um, so it's a bit like going, well, you know, let's have, uh, let's. It felt a bit like Guernsey launching a space program. It was, it was that <laughs> ridiculous. Um, and, away, and away we went. Um, and the the first year we did it, um, you have this endurance motor race. We've got a load of beneficiaries taking part. We've got a load of proper racers who are there. Touring car drivers. I mean, this year we just had Dario Franchitti, Marino Franchitti there. You know, I mean, this guy's won. He's won the Indy 500, you know, more than once. He's, he's um, just a megastar, just loving it. And then you've got a whole load of club racers of guys who go and spend their own money and, and just enjoy sport, um, as we all do, coming and getting into the spirit of it. And we stop this race, put the safety car out, bring everything in, it all lines up, and we run a service of remembrance in the pit lane. So you've got a Welsh male voice choir. You're next door to RF Valley, so we've got the we've got the um, military wives choir out of Valley, and you've got 700 people compressed into the pit lane. Every marshal comes in off the marshal position. Locals come in in order to be able to do it, and you you have a service of remembrance in the pit lane with a military padre. You know Gary Birch, who just got off the plane back from Estonia, literally grabbed his son and said, "Come on, we're going to Wales," and uh, and you do this. And the sun came out. It's come out on us every year. I don't understand why. I mean, it's 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 Anglesey in November, so every year at some point you get all of the weather 
it absolutely shits it down on you. And I, you know, the marquee tries to take off and head for Liverpool and all the rest of it. It's, you know, but uh, at that moment, it happened the first year, and it happened, and and it's happened pretty much every year since. Is that the weather just suddenly gives you respite, and the sun was beating on our backs, you know, and you, you're, I'm just stood there. In the silence, you know, that falling note of a bugler, thinking to myself, God, you know, I, this is incredible. And I also sort of had this sinking feeling of going, oh, I kind of, I've got to do this every year now. <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to be, this is so good. And it's, and it's absolutely wonderful. And actually, I think the thing that moves me now, because I'm, I, I hadn't done a remembrance thing before. I had stayed away from church and, wearing your medals and stuff like that. I, you know, I, that was not something that I was particularly eager to rush towards, but it's so good. It's so good. Um, and you've got people there every year, will take beneficiaries who have not been able to do something like that or would not have considered that they would, have not felt that sense of pride, would not be willing to wear their beret again putting their headdress on, pinning their medals on and supporting each other because, you know, in inevitably, you know, it's difficult. Remembrance, it's, it's not just about what happened 100 years ago that, you know, we don't have those old boys around to 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 bear witness to that anymore. It's, it's now um, and it's much more current. The thing that gets me, because I've seen that and I'm kind of used to it and I'm doing my best to support a population of our beneficiaries mm -hmm. through that but it's everybody else who stood around too so you, you've got all of these civvies who are just profoundly moved by this service of remembrance and they haven't necessarily had military service themselves it, they might be quite distant from that and haven't seen it but how many times in modern life do you stand in perfect silence for two minutes where there is no distraction where there's no phone there's no notifications there's no there's nothing which you're allowing in order to be able to get into that space and you're alone with your own thoughts in order to be able to do it in among 700 people who are all doing exactly the same thing at the same time and that's incredibly powerful and that's all about mindfulness and you learn a little bit about yourself every time you do that um and it's it's fantastic for us you know this band of brothers that's kind of grown around it but but it suddenly expands every time we do that you know you you make that circle a little bit bigger and you include a whole load of civvies and you know international racing stars who just who just go you know and i was talking to dario long after the race and he was the guy who was in the car so he happened to be in the car um safety car goes out he stops he comes he stands with everybody else he does the service he has to then get back in the car and go and drive back out again. He said, you know, I was two laps in. I was wiping the tears out of my eyes on the back straight because he was so profoundly moved. Um, now, he's not done military service, but he's had some huge accidents in his life. He's properly looked at death's door and and managed to come back from that and built a family around it and all of those things which, which kind of happen. And he found it profoundly moving. He was absolutely gobsmacked. And the joy of it is, you know, he's like going, right, we're coming back next year. I'm going to bring a manufacturer. I'm bringing bringing more friends with you you just see this thing growing and it's it it's uh it, it's quite extraordinary when you can do a thing like that i'm really proud of race of remembrance you know it's um it's something that's that's absolutely joyous and um and we use it in order to contribute towards the recovery journey of every one of our beneficiaries who's taking part that they're, they're all there too yeah they're doing race of remembrance but that's not the point they're there too gaining confidence they're there to have their horizons widened they're there to um uh deal with things in their past they're all doing it in order to be able to meet recovery goals and we we're really upfront and open with them on it well, we don't do motorsports at mission motorsport pretty much full stop we do motorsport in order to unlock things to take people on their recovery journey and actually help them um, it has to be about that. If you go and do something, anything, and it's about the thing, and you're using people who are wounded, injured, or sick, or have fallen off that ideal pathway of their lives, and you're using them in order to do the thing, you're missing the point. You do the thing in order to help the people. And that duty of care has sort of been at the core of everything we've done, really, since I came back, you know, frankly, twitching, you know, coming back through 
uh, Cyprus and decompression, being reunited with some of our guys who'd been, uh, you know, last time we'd seen them was going in the back of a Chinook or into a, into a Black Hawk to be medically evacuated. You know, and at that point you go, yeah, you know, we 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 need to do something to help them, and that's, and that has been the the sort of founding principle of the charity, and also our focus. We turn down lots of things that might be commercially great or or would look really fabulous, um, because our motivation for doing things is helping people, not not you know trying to attain some Everest of sports, whatever it might be. That's that's bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting you mentioned about D- Dario. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. A, there's there's a good Scottish name, isn't there? Good Scottish name, Dario. Like uh, who's that? Hang on, who's that Scottish? Pa- uh, Paolo Nutini. That's another Scottish name. Yeah, no, he's I Scottish, know. isn't he? There's Paolo yeah, Nutini. They absolutely are. There's this S- sounds th- this wonderful sort of Italian <laughs> Scottish contingent. You go to Corby, and you, you know, is that? <laughs> and it's full of Glaswegian. <laughs> Probably digressing. No, no really d- going, Dario, I mentioned, you know, he's he, uh, been in, uh, impacted profoundly by the, you know, the remembrance of going back and racing and saying about the civilians coming together for the service. And you're absolutely right. What else does that? What else for you? Know, the two minute silence. What else brings people together from whatever background, whatever religion, whatever? It's about remembrance, right? And yeah. it's, and I, I used to shy away from, uh, not shy away. It was more subconscious thing. I didn't go to the remembrance Sundays. Yeah. Um, uh, I I think I felt like a bit of an imposter because I wasn't dead. Yep. Uh, you know, it's like yeah, because yeah, guilt, well, guilt's a thing, right? Yeah, hundred um, percent. And I mean, just generalising. And but as time gone has gone on, and the tours have gone on, the years mm. have gone on, more people have been killed. I feel it's like a more responsibility to go and just pay mm. respect. And yeah. uh, sometimes I'll go. It all depends. It entirely depends on how I feel at the time. November is a. a a difficult period for a lot of people. It a lot, is. A emotional roller coaster. I also have a lot of other stuff goes in December, in November from family wise, right? All different things, uh, and and so it depends. How I feel you know. Sometimes I'll go yeah. to remember Sunday. Sometimes I won't. Sometimes I'll go and I'll wear my medals and I'll I'm a berry. Yeah. Other times I won't. This this year I went and I'd intended to go and wear medals and all the rest of it, and I ended up through circumstance and through sort of choice, I went in. Uh, just a coat, I had a t-shirt on. I was just casual, but that's how I was comfortable in being. Yeah, you know, yeah. I didn't go to the parade. I spent elsewhere. I was in London, but I was yeah. I was casual. I was comfortable with that. And that's how I was happy. I paid my respects. But what's what's interesting? We were talking about there again. Going back to Darius, and one of the things that I found with rugby heroes and through yeah. other things is we the our experiences uh, our uh, our experiences when, when we're in when we leave through uh, our own hardships or other people's hardships and, and what we experience of hardship in general whether it's ours or other people's mm. um we the, the lessons we learn are common to the, the lessons we learn are, are, can uh are, are, are lessons that can help anyone yeah. okay from whatever part of society you're from i can you know Civvy or not, mm. uh, you know, male. I'm, or I'm married to one. Male, yeah, I am. I'm not married to one. I've got a partner to one. Um, uh, so, so those lessons, I think, we we are very good as ex-military. We, we're very open. Okay. Anyway, regardless yeah, yeah. of experience, right? We, you know, we can. We're very. We're very open. talk shit to each other. We can mm. rip the piss out of each other. Mm. You know exactly. What you, you know it's ripping the piss. Yes. You know, water for ducks back for most people, not support company, right? Water for, <laughs> water, water for ducks back, you know. Each other's back. Y- or know, is that multiplicity? Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know what's black, you know what's white, okay? It's easy. And and yeah. so what makes it when people, civilians come in and are invited into that community, be it in Anglesey for that mm. day, right? Or be it any mission, you know, motorsport mm. mission or motive event, rugby heroes, a 353 event, and mm. they're brought in. They're treated by the military as if they're military in yep. conversation. Okay, yeah, we're yeah. completely open. They get ripped apart, but it, that, it's a comfort thing. They they become immediately a part. They become immediately a part of society. Yeah. They know exactly where they stand. They're exactly okay. There's no prejudice here. Yeah, there's absolutely. zero prejudice. Yeah, yeah. And no, so you're, you're getting ripped regardless. Yeah, uh, and we don't really care. But on the but again on the mental on the on mm. the uh, the mental struggle side of things, it's a it's comfort mm. for them. 
and that's not to say we're any better than civvies. It just so happens we are part of a, 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 a yeah. tight knit community just through our career, you know, and civilians invariably are not. And, yeah, and, no, I do. And there's huge benefit in it. There's huge benefit. I, I think what's going on at the moment with uh, the veteran community and the mental health aspect yeah. is hugely important for veterans, but I think it's hugely, hugely, hugely beneficial for the wider society in yeah. terms of mindfulness, in terms of well-being, in terms of you're more aware of yourself. Not in a fluffy, like, gay kind of way, but, uh, you yeah, know, right, but yeah. I don't mean gay. I mean, it's Thursday night, but yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you get my point. Yeah, no, completely. The, um, there's a, there's a really there's a really big overlap and i think we've, we've also there's been so much change i think since the likes of 2010 um where the defense recovery capability starts to be stood up so this weird agglomeration of different charity things with mod helping gay was the wrong choice of word by the way yeah i'll deal with it later <laughs> Good work. Yeah, the um, <laughs> that saves lives as well. <laughs> the the gainers. It does. Gainers, gainers saves lives. Oh, That's yeah, the man. next patch, mate. Gainers saves lives. James Cameron, you get the patches there you out. Go. Awesome. That's it. You, you heard it here first. <laughs> and then go on. Sorry for interrupting. Um, and uh, the well, that's it. We've gone off. We've gone off at a massive tangent now. But he um, the, there's a there's a really interesting thing I think with the way that service charities and the MOD interact with each other, that it's almost unrecognisable now to that which it used to be. There used to be a very big division in between the two, in the, 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 whereas the line between what is charity and what is MOD now is, is blurred much greater. And that's been elaborate that, on that? Well, that's been to the benefit of, of those that have come through. So um, uh, if you... Uh, if you are wounded on operations, if you fall by the wayside during your military career, you enter a system which is absolutely peppered everywhere by interaction with things which sit outside which aren't the MOD. And whether that's because you're going through Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which is a proper big NHS hospital, but you know, you're gonna get visited by you're gonna get visited by the cake lady. You're going to be you're gonna be going on a um uh, on a, a course that's that's run and paid for by the Royal British Legion in order to reintroduce you to the kind of sport that might be available to you. You'll stay in a recovery centre where um, the vast majority of that which is provided through that recovery centre has come about through Help for Heroes, for example. You will go and uh, enter a whole series of recovery sport that's delivered by a whole host of different people, and at its pinnacle you've got Invictus. And uh, and all of those things that kind of sit around, and whether it's Royal Foundation or through Endeavour Fund, and so all of a sudden this sits outside an MOD budget. This sits outside what normally the Chief of the Defence Staff would expect that this is his ballywick. All of a sudden there's there's a blurring of those lines, both in between what is MOD and what sits outside, and that's only right. And that's why you see the new Office of Veterans Affairs aren't an MOD entity; they sit under the Cabinet Office. And they sit under the cabinet's office because if you're going to look after veterans, you also need to be talking. And you know they're they're no longer MODs; they now belong to Department of Work and Pensions, NHS, local government, and so therefore you've got to have this pan-governmental way of looking after and way of helping them. And it's why that Office of Veterans Affairs is a cabinet office piece of work instead of uh, instead of sat within MOD. <coughs> um, but interaction in between these entities is not is not something that traditionally used to happen. And like any kind of change, inevitably there have been some that have resisted it along the way. And I think there's still some way to go in terms of how we um, how we really successfully interact and how we share in the success of each other's. So where a charity in the past would be very keen to identify, this is one of our beneficiaries. I mean, that's, yeah, I can think of so many examples of where somebody's held up as a, as a, as an exemplar. And I think that's, that can be so damaging um, because they're not ours. You're just privileged to be able to help them for a period of their life with an aspect of, of their recovery. And 
And actually, if you map the route of any one individual, it's been a whole load of different organisations that have contributed together in order to be able to sustain and bolster that individual and help them to wherever they need to go. And all of those organisations are immensely privileged that some bloke at his time of need has reached out and it was them that 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 he reached out to and accepted their, their help, um, not the other way around. There's something else that, that military charities can tend to fall back into doing, which is they look for military solutions to the problem. And that's great, but it can be short-termism. So if a guy in Warwick has uh, is sad and has suicidal thoughts, and that's identified and flagged up in by whatever means, the service charities are brilliant at rallying around in order to be able to go, well, let's connect him back with, let's connect him with the caseworker, let's join him up with his, with his veteran community there, let's link him back to his regimental association or ship or aeroplane or hotel or wherever it was that he came from. Um, and that's great, but ultimately that's only a short-term solution. You've got to take a step back and go, what was it about this individual and Warwick that wasn't meeting his needs? How is Why is he failing as a civilian? What's he not getting? And how can you help that community to reach out and embrace a bloke who's had an extraordinary gestation in order to be able to get there, who's had an incredible life experience? How can you use that in order to enhance the community of people who live in that, that place? And in turn... Give him what he needs in terms of meaning, of reason to get out of bed in the morning, and uh, and a sense of purpose, and all of those things, which which are the things that we all need in order to be able to sustain us beyond you know um, that hierarchy of needs. You, you've you've got to feel loved, needed, that you have value, that when you wake up in the morning, that you throw the duvet off and go and do something because because there's some purpose behind it. Um, and if you look back and go, every time he falls over, you go, well, let's take you back to where you were, then you're missing a trick. You've got to be able to look forward and sort of span that that piece. And it's uh, some do it better than others, and you're starting to see collaboration becoming much, much better. I'm so proud of the work that the that we do through the Confederation of Service Charities. We just sit in a room discussing what's best for beneficiaries. The Confederation of Service Charities? I've not heard of this. Go on. Mm, Cobcio. There they are. And you, you're right; it doesn't it, it doesn't work. But they are the Confederation of Service Charities (C O B S E O), um, and they are an an entity which pulls together all of the different interests within the military charity sector. Um, uh, it, it, there's an old general of mine. So, funnily enough, when I was in Kabul the first time round, it was John McCall who was commanding. It was Op Fingal then, wasn't it? I think that was the that was the the first op. Yeah, Fingal. Yeah. And it was yeah, John McCall was was commanding things then. He's he's the uh, he's the head of Cobcio, trying to pull together this sort of ragtag bug of how many was it three and a half thousand service charities, but actually many of those are trusts or cadet associations or Royal British Legion branches and things like that, as opposed to um, what we sort of traditionally think of as charities. There's a lot of there's a lot of charitable trusts and things which sat there too. Um, to coalesce and steer those and send them in the right direction. I think the interaction between those charities, so I sit on a couple of COBCO, they're effectively working groups. They're called clusters, and I'm such a child, it makes me snigger every time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, um, I'm deputy chair of the um, WIS veterans working group, so those who are wounded, injured, and sick uh, veterans em with relation to employment, so helping people into jobs. And sat around the table, you've got all of the big players who you, who you would expect and they're sharing information about what they do um, really openly with the others around the table. And to do that, you have to have trust and you have to have collaboration and you have to have the beneficiary's best interests at heart. And they do. And it always makes me wince because on social media, you'll always go people going, oh, you know, yeah, no, they're terrible, that charity. And normally one of the big ones, you know, they'll go, oh, oh mate breaks my fucking balls it breaks my fucking balls man and and they may well have a individual instance of going well you know um my mate reached out to them when he was most in need and they they said they wouldn't have anything to do with him and you're like hang on you 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 went to a charity that doesn't do that it's, it's not just that it's not just that it's yeah. this right a fucking charity is an organization okay yeah. uh, this is what a chat they're like any other organization yeah okay 
especially the big ones with branches mm. everywhere. As a, as a, an organization gets bigger, it becomes very, very difficult to yeah. maintain the quality you started off with, whether that was shit quality when you started off or yeah, whether it was brilliant. Okay. Yeah, you're going to get morons. Like you get in the military, you're going to get morons. You're going to get brilliant people. You're going to get, mm. you're going to get, departments and teams that operate yeah. really badly. Yeah. You can others that operate really well. You're going to get a dickhead as a knob on the end of the phone and makes the wrong decision. You're going to get mm. an awesome person on the end of the phone and goes over and beyond what they're required to do. Yeah, Maybe their charity can't do it and they refer you to another charity even though they're not allowed to do that because they want to put them in their charity because they need the money because the fund is going down. Right? This is what pisses me off. It's like, like um, there's this thing about uh, an RBL uh, an RBL um, Royal British Legion branch in yes. eight Suffolk somewhere yeah. which has gone down the pan. Um, money dramas, stuff that ended up, and, and because of that, they won't buy a poppy. Oh, like, oh for yeah, God's sake! Yeah, well, yeah, no, but at the same time, RBL are one of the people I, I've benefited from. Yeah, RBL think. are people who I know friends have benefited. From. It's a fucking Royal British Legion. Yeah, absolutely. you don't, you know, you don't just disown them. And it's the same for the small charities. Yeah, it, 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 there's a people complain about the amount of charities there are. Yeah. right? I think it's over four thousand now, not three and a half. I think it's over no. four thousand now. And like you rightly said. Trusts, yeah. charities, yeah. associations. Okay, they all fun of that banner, but funny enough, people yeah. tend to not look into the numbers and just yeah, of course, yeah. Take the prime, it's right? an easy one. It's an easy one to be able to. But do. those little charities come about because people feel very strongly of about course. a personal experience through, like you said, yeah. someone to get the help needed from the RBL, someone to get the help needed of H four H, someone to get help needed from flipping the MOD. Mm. Yeah, right. There's a gap. Let's plug it, and they start their own charity. Completely well meaning. That's how these mm. all come about. When in fact. It, it that's that's only happening because there's, there's no great solution like you're saying yeah absolutely. there's a lot a lot of work he's doing to tie the charities in talk to each other yeah. they're they're all all the honest ones <laughs> mm. they're all amazing they're yeah. all amazing yeah. even the ones that get dragged across the coals like combat stress they're mm. all amazing in things they do they've also all made mistakes but yeah, that is just like companies, corporations. It's just how it happens. Just how it happens. The beauty of the charity sector is, uh, the, char yeah, the charity sector is, we, there is potential to be able to pull in communication between them all, to be able to pull them together and, yeah. and, and better orchestrate it, which is not possible with a bunch of companies in the same industry. No, you're absolutely right. In the same right. sector. For the benefit of all the charities. Yeah. You know. And it's, and it's things like Cobsio that, that, that do knit them together and, and help. I mean, the, the last thing, Oh, I've, I've said it before. Last thing I ever wanted to do was to start another bloody service charity. I was like, just a shit idea. And I still think it's a shit idea. I mean, it's just awful. <laughs> it was the worst thing in the world. But I, uh, I was, I was really struck, having come back from Afghanistan in 2011, about an area of sport that I knew loads about. So I've got a real background in motorsport and instruct and do all of these bits and pieces. And there were some things which were being done with great philanthropic intent, all the best intent in the world, but unprofessional delivery. And it was causing more harm than good. And when you've got a guy who's back on a ward at Queen Elizabeth's getting extra bits sawn off him because he's contracted an infection because there was no medical risk assessment in place. And instead the guy had gone, yeah, no, I want to go and do... Dakar, so I'm going to go and do hill running and all of the rest of it. And he was off duty, so therefore, theoretically, he's not covered under the Armed Forces Compensation Scheme because he wasn't on duty when he did it. You're not helping him. You're, you're, not, you're setting back not just his recovery, but at worst, the potential, you know, how far he could recover. And unless you put their needs first and foremost, then, then it's kind of the wrong way to go about it. And I felt really strongly about that and complained to MOD and just was met with a wall of you know more about this than we do. Um, and motorsport was never considered to be a sport by the army until 2009. Um, it was done, I think, things like the Armed Forces Rally Team was done under the auspices of training. And it was only when a civil servant put the brakes on in 2009 and it became recognised as an official sport. So all the things that the likes of rugby enjoy, where there's coaching structures and all of the rest of it and teams at different levels and very well understood practices for doing things in motorsport simply didn't exist. And so I was, I was tasked to write a paper for MOD at the end of 2011, which made some recommendations. I tried really, really hard. When did you get out, by the way? So I, I Sorry, got out, just a quick one. Yeah, no, end, uh, end of 2012, beginning okay, cool. of 2013. Yep. And, um, uh, 
yes, and I was doing this as a as a serving officer. Absolutely no intent of leaving or getting out and doing anything quite as ridiculous as that. Um, but went and visited. So I went and visited the ski team who were doing fantastic stuff. I went and visited Toe in the Water who were teaching people to sail on the south coast. I spent a chunk of time with the likes of Martin Colclough and Help for Heroes just just absorbing how they were going about using sport as this incredible tool to promote recovery. And then asking questions about, well, how is this funded? And there's all sorts of weirdness. So if you do something which is single service, you can't have a team which is veterans and serving at the same time. But with a combined service team, you can. So, Really? Yeah. Why is that? Lord knows. I do, God knows. I don't know. Wellington made a decision at Waterloo and it's been Caroline Anderson. <laughs> I have no idea. But it, And it's that mixing of public and non-public money that drives you down a certain path of, of kind of doing things. And you go, well, okay, so you've got to have a way of being able to get spon- – because if, if you reflect reality, you go, MOD is never going to pay for this to do it as well as it should be. So you've got to be able to bring money in from outside. And that means commercial or compassionate interest. Um, and then how do you handle that money? It has to be transparent. You've got to be held accountable to where that money goes. So someone gives you a quid, you, you've got to deliver against it. And that, of course, is the charitable structure. That's why it exists. You have articles and objects against which you're held accountable. So, uh, you know, it's the hard way to do it, and it's the long way around. Um, but that's why Mission Motorsport was formed as the Forces Motorsport Charity, because it was on behalf of defence. It was it was put in place by the British Army Motorsport Association that had the lead for um, delivery for wounded, injured and sick, um, and started up on the 1st of March 2012 with a bank account of zero. So Mission Motorsport Charity founded mm. by yours truly? Yes, yeah, with a bunch of, with a bunch of help from my friends. Um, uh, both both inside the military and also outside, you know, just getting some help with commerce and things like that. Just had no idea about that sort of thing and, and lent on some some friends in order to be able to help us to kind of pull that together, to get that right structure in place. Tony. Nah, <laughs> yeah. If only I'd known. <laughs> if only. It would have been guy to take him well, on a very Tony, Well, Tony Lewis, yeah. just going back, Tony Lewis is, is an example yeah. of a small charity yeah. it, it, that operates per- perfectly. Yeah, I think you know. I, I don't without well, any no, bias at all. There's nothing I don't. Yeah, hey, <laughs> he's no, a, yeah, he's a good looking man as well. Hey, isn't he's it? a good looking man. He's a good looking <laughs> man. There's a, <laughs> there's absolutely no. There's, I have got this nothing against. Is getting dark. I know, mate. I've got no dark. What? You, oh yeah. Don't. I've got no issue <laughs> with a chari- Someone wants to start a charity. I yeah. have not. You know, it, it, it's the it's uh, my issue with the intent and the purpose behind it. Okay, but who knows what that is? Yeah. But. Tony's charity, you know, 353 Trust, obviously named after 353rd uh, British person to be British forces person to be killed in Afghan, Tony's son, Conrad Lewis, yeah, who uh, got killed, uh, serving alongside three para. I knew him, fucking amazing dude. Did know him well by uh, the pleasure of um, yeah. I had him on my team for a particularly interesting uh, Whitehall, Whitehall level approved little lot that we did. And uh, I'm glad yeah. he had him on there. Um, I'm digressing. 353 Trust, which is Tony's charity, again, which I and friends of mine have been beneficiaries of. I mean, that charity, mate, it's small in terms of structure, small in terms sure. of people. It's him and Sandy and a handful of others, right? Mm. And they, you know, people get referred to them. People get referred to them in whatever way, or they become across people who, who need assistance. They assist those people. Yeah. Job done. Yeah, okay? absolutely. They raise funding really subtly. I'm not saying this is what, the way everyone should go about it. I'm just mm. saying this is how 353 do it. They raise funding really subtly um, through events that they do or through people who know Tony, know Sandy, know people who have been involved, yeah. and through things like the, the podcast we've written for them and stuff yeah. like that, and Rugby for Heroes, you know. And they just, they, okay, there's a need. Let's meet the need. Done. What can we do next? There's a need. Here's what we can do because this is our funding. Done. Where's the next need? They, and it's deliberately kept like that. Yeah, yeah. The impact and the quality of yeah, of, of, of uh, assistance they give people are second to none. Yeah. As good as the big charities with all the money. You yeah. know, they both have their place. They both have their place. But going yeah. back, it's, it's a coordination thing. They absolutely do. And But it's also that, that knowledge of what others are doing as well. So you're not duplicating what's done elsewhere. You're not, you haven't got needless bureaucracy. Um, and that you're, you're not actually – you've just got to question your motives. So 
and it's so easy to get dragged out of your lane. So um, <clears throat> we have beneficiaries who will come and identify with us because they might be massive petrol heads. And there's something that perhaps that clearly we can help them with, a training journey that will help them end up in employment beyond. And Wounded Engine Sick guys, we've now over 200 are still in empl um, have entered employment through directly coming through our team in order to then end up in jobs. Mission Motorsport and then on the Mission Automotive. Correct. So, well, they, Mission Motorsports. These are whiz guys that we've helped, guys and girls that we've helped, who they've found employment through it. And that, the measure of effectiveness, so rather than look at this sort of, you know, two weeks after you sprayed them in champagne, are they still, have they still got a job? Six months is kind of pointless because, to be honest, you're still in a... Uh, you're still kind of learning about what that employment is and you haven't got the full cover of employment law and things like that. So we look at the two-year point. So we go two years on, are these people employed? And we know that more than 84% of our beneficiaries are. A lot of the ones that aren't might not be because they've stepped out in order to be able to go and do something else. They might have entered full-time education. They might have decided that, no, that's it. You know, I've, I've got enough money coming in. I'm going to concentrate on the families. They might have made a conscious decision to do it as opposed to being back on the job market. Now, that's way in excess of, well, Department of Work and Pensions have a return to work scheme, which they look at the efficacy of at the six-month point. So they go six months after how many of these people are in work, and they average between 26 and 28% of people who go through that course are actually in work. So we're at 84 at the two-year point. Hmm. Now, that's actually higher than pretty much any other statistic that we can find as we're sort of looking around, you know, to, for, for regular people who are entering employment. So it's pretty strong. We know it works. But on the back of that, because you might have a employer who is uh, who's opened the door to it because of the wounded, injured, and sick thing, and it might be because you know something like Invictus Games, but it then gives you the access to their HR procedures and those levers, and it's really easy to make small changes, which suddenly open the gates to a whole bunch of veterans, service levers, spouses, who otherwise they wouldn't have seen or they wouldn't have attracted, or if they had done, they would have accidentally filtered them out. Um, and that's what Mission Automotive is about. It, the Mission Automotive is helping a company to develop an armed forces engagement scheme that meets their needs. And for some, that's about HR. They need to hire new people. So you make sure that you're not filtering out blokes by degree, by prior industry experience. You make sure that when they read a CV... Um, instead of just going, sniper, yes, I want one of those. They're instead looking beyond that in order to look at the qualities of the bloke. Because we're all culturally, we, if you've served, you're culturally disadvantaged from going through an HR process. HR is based on you talking about yourself in the first person. And when did you in your service career write about yourself in the first person? Never. You only ever write about others, and whether that's a course report, whether that's a promotion report, whether that's your annual reporting, you never write about yourself. It's always writing about somebody else in the third person. And if you do refer to yourself, you don't say I, you say we. And, and that's it. And that's at senior NCO officer level. You go down below that yeah. to screw. Well, uh, lands Jack and below they they don't write about themselves or other people. No, so and, and so they again that that's a lack of. Understanding the language use, understanding about the word things, understanding of, and, and in that, right about the people you learn about where your own qualities are, you talk about transferable skills. How good a sniper were you? I'm not going to answer that question. Were you, <laughs> were you better than all of your peers? Were you better than the blokes who went before you? Are you better than everyone who came after you? No. No, okay. So that's the first thing out of your mouth. Of course not, because that's a horrible thing to say and you just don't do it but the whole basis of writing a cv or performing well at interview is about saying <laughs> okay so the last job i did let's use any job that i've done as an example when i went in there i was so much better than the guy before me totally changed everything that he'd done and i was alongside a bunch of other people who were my peers and i was head and shoulders better than those guys and the blokes who worked for me would have been terrible had it not been for my inspirational leadership pulling him up by the bootstraps and the bloke who came after me, oh, you know, good luck to him. That's horrible. I mean, it's just, it feels wrong. But that is entirely what that um, 
first person talking about articulating yourself and picking out these prime qualities off the top, responding to interview questions where you talk about how you were the pivotal thing that happened. No, it was a team. It was us. We did it together. Culturally, we find that really difficult to do. And and that puts us on a back foot when you're entering a, a civilian HR process. And and they don't want to be inarticulate. They don't want to not speak your language. They want to see the quality. They're trying to do something which is really quite difficult. Uh, you go out to the outside world and you go, Look, we want someone to fill this job. But they'll write the job description inevitably in industry speak because in every industry you develop your own patois, your own acronyms, your own way of talking about things. So um, a Jaguar Land Rover example, you know, you're offering a really, really good job. Half of the Northern Hemisphere wants to apply for that job, and a whole bunch of Indians do as well. So how do you how do you make a ridiculous number of applications? Uh, how do you get that down to a manageable number? So you put in place some fairly simple things. So no degree, no prior industry experience, and you're if you think about your peers, how many of those have you just got rid of at a single stroke? And how, are you getting rid of people of no quality? No, you you just getting rid of people who don't don't have a degree, had a very different sort of upbringing, and instead their higher education was one that, you know, was conducted in Sunnybridge and, you know, or on the parade square in front of in front of Buckingham Palace. And that's of no less value. Um, and helping HR departments to have different tools so that they can make good decisions about people is is what we what we kind of help them to do. And when they get it, they really get it. Um, and Jaguar Land Rover, I think, a glorious example. Since the launch of Mission Automotive, we're just really excited that we're doing a big piece of work with Toyota at the moment that's putting people into. So that's the 11th largest company in the world. You know, the most, Is it really? Most profitable motor Of all companies? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, have joined Mission Automotive. That's a fairly surreal, you know, that's a, <laughs> that's a pretty cool thing. And... Um, we've a, a little three months into that you know we put eight blokes into jobs already both service leavers and veterans so these guys who were lost looking for somewhere or underemployed beneath their potential have now got an employer and a pathway and a supported route that has removed many of the obstacles that were in their path and um and that's absolutely phenomenal and it's interesting because toyota one of their big big reasons for doing it is not about um so yes they need quality people of course they do um but it's actually about um also employee satisfaction and that's not just for the veterans who work for them it's for the people who work for toyota in the uk who are building cars in um, um uh in you know derbyshire and d side and the people who are working in um uh across the retailers is that they see the company which they work for doing something that reflects the values that they themselves hold. And that's really powerful. That's very cool. And as a reason to kind of enter into it, and as one of the one of the metrics against which you're measuring things, that's um that's a lovely way for a business to go about doing it. And uh, we've added Volvo. Um we as a result of last week we had a really big event with the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders in London. And as a result, um, Lotus, who also, like Volvo, actually owned by Geely, Chinese company, um, have got some really ambitious plans. Um, and as you know, you know, lads, when they leave the military, will tend to go back to where the families are from and where that supporting structure comes from. And anywhere where you can point at in the world where the employment opportunities are more limited than, than others, are areas where you have struggle, and if you know you're pointing at St Athan in South Wales, where Aston Martin are, you know, going to be building electric Lagondas out of there in the new DBX. Oh. You look at Lotus in in Norfolk, um, but any retailer anywhere, um, regardless of where we get that phone call from, or somebody says, you know, I'm I'm moving back when I leave the Navy, when I leave the Marines, when I leave the Air Force, I'm I'm going back to where the family's from. We've got a pretty good chance of being able to line them up with someone, something really cool. Um, and that's that's really exciting. Um, and what we've done is is we've articulated it for companies in a different way. So there's no sort of set template that will will apply. You actually come alongside the company and you spend a lot of time then understanding what their strategy is. Because if you're to help them develop their own armed forces engagement strategy, 
it's got to be um, it's got to make commercial sense and it's got to be in support of their own strategy and so they're all different they're all different shapes and sizes um, and uh, and that's been been fantastic for us talking to just just companies of all different shapes and sizes um, from single bloke startups all the way up to you know the likes of Toyota Tesla you know have some fantastic really interesting challenges um, even then, comms though yeah yeah, big time. And they've got a huge veterans program in the States. Tesla veteran, if you go and Google that, you, you just pull up an enormous amount of resources. Facebook's the, the same. Facebook's the same. Yeah. And they're trying to do it over here now. But it's not made its way across the Atlantic. Absolutely. So, so all right, we're fixing that. And you know, they are absolutely determined to go, yeah, this is important to us. Because as a car company, you know, they are different. And they do things in a different way. But things like the Model 3 coming along means they're suddenly they're up against everybody, including the big boys, and you can only hide behind being new for so long. And when someone's poking you in the chest going, I don't like this, what do you stand for as a company? You can only hide behind, well, you know, we're new and it's all about EVs. You're like, look, I can go and buy an EV from lots of other places and you're not new anymore because um, you've, you've been around for some time. And that's when you, as a company, you've got to you've got to have a set of values against which you stand by, and you go, "No, hang on, this is this is why we do things. This is what we work. This is part of our framework." It very much exists in the states, doesn't exist in this country, doesn't exist in Europe, and we're having some absolutely amazing conversations about. All right, well, let's let's work out exactly how we how we take this forward, and um, and there's some really exciting times coming up. You know, there's. Uh, the automotive industry is being absolutely transformed by electrification, um, as well as a change in buying habits that people, you know, don't tend to go to dealerships anymore. Mate, I had a leaf for a few days from this mm. way. Yeah, what did you think of it? I fucking I want one. It's remarkable, isn't it? There's I, just been this tipping point. I, of, honest to God, yeah. well, I mean, the single biggest thing the the USP for me was it quartered my fuel costs for that three or four days. Yeah. And when you do it, I do it a lot of mileage. Is that man? And plus, with my tinnitus, yeah, and like my partial hearing. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. silent. The car's silent. Yeah, absolutely. It's very, very quiet. So yeah. in my car, in a normal um, combustion engine car, yeah. if there's people sitting in the back, yeah. I ain't having a conversation because I can't hear them because all the background noise it yeah, really messes with my hearing. Yeah. Hey, EV, silent man. I don't have to have the radio full blast so I can hear the podcast. Not my podcast. Podcast. I, don't, I can hear people. I can have a conversation with people in the back. It's like, it's so like you listen a, to your own a, podcast a, in the car. A, only the good ones. I, w <laughs> I won't be listening to this one. <laughs> no, quite right. Let's see. You went off a tangent. We've uh, so, we've got talking about our love for Tony Lewis. <laughs> and he, yeah. The Tony we've got Lewis a... Love Podcast is brought to you <laughs> by Black Sheep. This is where I'm from, by the way. Oh, you just I'm really impressed. It. You got. Mate, us. We just we got a couple of minutes left. Hmm. You just opened your beer. Yeah. We uh, we, all, we have actually got a couple of minutes left. So, um, shameless plug opportunity. Yeah. What have you not covered? What have you not mentioned? Um, and how can people get older? The um, we're doing some really interesting stuff at the moment. So sounds like it. Yeah. Um, I'm training up a team right now to do the Autosport Live Action Arena. So Autosport is the start of the motorsport year. It's second week in January, so I think it's eighth um, to the tenth, eighth to the twelfth. Sorry. Um, in the NEC, takes over the place, but there is a live action arena at the centre of it, which is seriously cool. And we headlined the live action arena a couple of years ago with Billy Munger, uh, who we taught to drive again, and Terry Grant. Billy Munger, one leg Billy Munger? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, the guy who amputated his legs. The yeah, really young lad? Yeah, exactly. Ah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, who's now, you know, on a path towards F1 and all of the rest Seymour of it. Seymour is one of the most inspirational he's people you can, you can follow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, he's... He shared a surgeon with a whole load of our blokes. Uh, Military surgeon working in Nottingham at the time. And that was that was the guy who, who did his, his amputations. Is this the same person who dealt with Johnny Ball? Mm, no. I don't Johnny was so. on about some military surgeon who mm, squared him away. Not, yeah. Anyway, go on. And, um, and it was amazing. Just an extraordinary thing to do. And we took, uh, we took quite a small team, um, but it was transformational for them. So Paul Weiss was one of them. Um, you know, I, I, Buzz, 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 Buzz. 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 <laughs> Cheers, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> sorry, for people, cool. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry for people listening. Me going Buzz. We had some uh, some noise coming through the headphones. Yeah, go on. Sorry, James. 
So we, um, uh, so Paul Weiss, Military Crossholder, was one of those um, uh, who went and did something really cool. Uh, we are lining up to headline that with Terry Grant this year. So we've got a mixed team of, uh, I think, 10 who are going forward to go and do it this time. Veterans, a um, few serving guys in amongst them as well, who, who are in line for medical discharge. Um, guys training up to be a stuntman. Um, a service spouse, so someone who served themselves and also was a as a spouse, doing it as part of their recovery journey, and we we're going to be um, lighting up the uh, uh, the NEC live action arena for autosport, and that's a really cool piece of kit for those those to do, and alongside some pretty cool brands too. So if um, uh, but today's the most exciting piece was um, it's going to have a bit of a military theme clearly the piece that we'll do. So they'll be doing a precision driving display in amongst uh, the band of the Irish Guards. Oh. So we're going to put them in the arena and basically do donuts around Don't them. Don't run them over. Um, yeah. Well, as an opportunity to run over a man in a bearskin <laughs> uh, holding a trombone is, um, <laughs> in, in a new Morgan is, uh, is fairly surreal. So for those, those guys and girls, that's a really cool piece of work. But in February, we're going to run a transitional support event, and this is really new and unusual. But it's building on the back of the big events which we run for wounded, injured, and sick. But we're going to run it for people who are in transition. So those who need a job in 2020 and 2021. And we're going to pull together a whole load of cool brands and causes and things like that and put it all under in the wing. And we'll use the GP circuit at Silverstone. So at some point, yeah, you know, if you want to, if you want to get your bum in a Koenig's egg, that's a pretty good reason to, to get down to Silverstone. But you're also going to meet a lot of employers You'll get time alongside recruiters. Um, none of it with any commitment or anything like this. It's all about supporting the individual. I'll go alongside LinkedIn. It'll help sort out LinkedIn profiles and things like that. But we'll also meet an awful lot of veterans who are working for these companies. So you go and meet people who have been through the same experience that, that perhaps you might be going through. Um, just to help to widen people's horizons, to educate them um, about just what is potential and what is out there. We're going to run it in February with the support of Silverstone, and that's going to be a really exciting event. But if you want to kind of find us or the charity, um, uh, missionmotorsport.org and missionautomotive.org, we'll both get you to the right place. And obviously, we're on Facebook, uh, we're on Twitter, um, and uh, and I'm on Twitter too much. Um, so uh, so it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to, uh, to kind of get in touch with us at Tank Slater. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. There you go, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Cheers, Jim. Thanks, my friend. <laughs>